Part 7. What the human race is all about. Some scholars would argue that the best way to judge the human race is by summarising its greatest achievements and weighing them in the balance. This is obviously nonsense. Da Vinci, Galileo, Shakespeare, Mozart, Newton, Einstein et al. were clearly blessed with genius and enriched the lives of millions with their brilliance. However, they had little in common with the majority of the human race. We are not all creative or scientific geniuses. Far from it, in fact. But at some time in our lives, most of us have a go. This willingness to risk everything to achieve a goal is what, for me, defines the spirit of the human race. It would be easy to applaud those who've had a go and succeeded. But for me, those that went for it and failed in a spectacular fashion are more worthy of note. More deserving of a niche in the Human Being Hall of Fame, simply because they can make the rest of us feel extremely clever in comparison. One of the most endearing qualities of the Homo sapiens is our ability to do the most unbelievably stupid things. Certain gifted individuals have stunned the world with their selfless, thoughtless and usually brainless acts of monumental folly and peerless stupidity. What follows as a brief catalogue are some of the more noteworthy disasters our fellow humans have managed to perpetrate upon themselves. I haven't made them up because I couldn't. No one could. However, I assure you that they are all authentic and reliably reported occurrences that have appeared in respected publications throughout the world. In this next section, truth leaves fiction standing in the starting blocks complaining that it didn't even hear the gun. Bad idea of the year. Sometimes, heavy military transport aircraft need to take off from short runways. If they can't manage this under their own power, they will use a JATO, Jet Assisted Takeoff Unit, which is a high-powered solid fuel rocket. If you somehow came into possession of a JATO, what would you do with it? Well, not long ago, the Highway Patrol in Arizona discovered a pile of twisted, charred metal embedded three feet into a cliff face, 125 feet above the ground. Their first thoughts were that it must be a light aircraft that had crashed into the cliff, but on further inspection, it turned out to be the remains of a 1967 Chevy Impala. A certain amount of detective work established the likely cause of this rather unusual collision. The driver of the Chevrolet had acquired a JATO and bolted it onto his car. He had then selected a long straight road, accelerated to a reasonable speed, and then fired the JATO. This would have caused the Impala to accelerate to 350 miles per hour within five seconds, the thrust continuing for at least another 20 seconds. Two and a half miles after ignition, the thick rubber marks on the road surface indicated that the driver had attempted to use the brakes which immediately melted, blowing all four tyres. By this time, the driver was totally insignificant as far as having any control over the rest of the journey, especially when the car reached a bend in the road and took off. The car flew for about one and a half miles before smashing into a cliff face 125 feet above ground, where it embedded itself in a crater three and a half feet deep. The majority of the driver's remains were not recoverable, although fragments of fingernail and bone were removed from what was believed to be a section of the steering wheel. No matter how much fun this little adventure might sound, don't try it at home, kids. Fubble Trouble, Miami, Florida, March 1995. According to the Newcastle Herald of 22nd of 3rd, 95, the stunningly named Nature and Fubble decided to rob his local delicatessen. Sadly for him, the owner didn't feel like being robbed that day and smashed him in the face with a giant salami, breaking his nose. Fubble legged it, and in a bid to evade capture, hid in the boot of a car. The boot of a car belonging to an undercover police surveillance team. It was five days before he was discovered and released. No arm done. A Mr. Radique caused quite a stare when he left his flat in Hamden, Connecticut. The new tenants were rather upset when they found a pair of neatly dissected human arms under the sink. Mr. Radique was an orthopaedic surgeon who had taken the arms from Yale School of Medicine to practice on at home. Whilst packing, 
he had simply forgotten all about them. Very toothsome. Three teeth are not what most people would expect to find in a galaxy double nuts and raisins bowl. Meryl Baker did, and complained to Mars. The story was reported in the press. However, when Mrs Baker next visited her dentist, he pointed out that three of her own back teeth were missing. Mrs Baker admitted that she felt a little foolish. Retail News Agent, 18th the 2nd, 95. Making a bomb. British nuclear fuels were a tad surprised recently when they received a fax from a second-hand car dealer called Tom in Idaho, offering them first refusal on a pre-owned nuclear fuel reprocessing plant, complete with instruction manual. Presumably, the previous owner was a little old lady who only used it to vaporise the local shops on the way to church. The American government was somewhat worried by this turn of events, as this is not the sort of equipment they would want gentlemen such as Saddam Hussein finding in their Christmas stocking. Maybe US defence officials should have considered this beforehand, for it was they that sold the equipment to Tom Johansson at the Frontier Car Corral in Pocatello, Idaho in the first place. An official from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did phone Mr Johansson to warn him that he would not be allowed to export the equipment, which put a bit of a crimp on his day, as he had serious interest from both Australia and Japan already. Anyone fancying a cruise should give the Pentagon a ring. <laughs> they might sell you one. A sterling performance. Big fun on the set of Mel Gibson's film Braveheart. 500 extras ended up in hospital after getting a bit carried away during a reenactment of the Battle of Stirling, 1297, or thereabouts. The extras were recruited from the Irish Reserve Army and were paid £30 a day to hack away at each other using a variety of weighty implements. The over-enthusiasm was blamed on the fact that the Irish Reserves see very little real action and were probably making the best of it. Most of the injuries were from cuts and bruises, but a few of the less doughty warriors collapsed from sunstroke and dehydration. As if this wasn't enough for the beleaguered Antipodean to cope with, the gods of comedy saw to it that a hillside battle had to be reshot, and some bright spark noticed that three of the 13th century Celtic warriors were wearing glasses. And another scene was scrapped altogether, because in the thick of a life and death struggle, all the protagonists were seen to be laughing their heads off. Batty. During World War II, the US Air Force captured vast amounts of bats in order to develop a bat bomb. The theory being that the little airborne rodenty things would fly into enemy territory and blow things up with the little bombs that they were carrying. After two million dollars of research and development, the only things the bats had managed to destroy were an aircraft hangar and a general's car. Level-headed. A certain Anthony Philip Hicks from Truro in Cornwall decided to demonstrate his enthusiasm for funk popsters, level 42, by changing his name to something more befitting a true fan of the band. His new moniker is Ant, level 42, The Pursuit of Accidents, The Early Tapes, Standing in the Light, True Colours, A Physical Presence, World Machine Running, In the Family Running, In the Family Platinum Edition, Staring at the sun, level best guaranteed, the remixes forever now influences, changes, Mark, King, Mike, Lindup, Phil, Gould, Boone, Gould, Wally, Badaru, Lindup, Badaru. Ant admits that some people might think I am crazy. Presumably, he's referring to his bankers, who will have to provide him with a 14-foot checkbook. Pratt. King Crustacean. This is surely the finest piece of news this century. Dateline Dover. A girl who had drifted out to sea on a set of inflatable teeth was heroically rescued by a man on a blow-up lobster. You can't even fabricate stories like that. Alien Tomato. Britain is considering banning a genetically engineered tomato that has been approved for sale in the States. Our government watchdog is worried that tomato containing two alien genes could spread bacterial disease via their innate antibiotic resistance. Called the Flavor Saver Tomato, it is the fruit of a science and patent battle between Zeneca, an offshoot of ICI, and Calgene, an American company. Sounds rather lovely. Incognito. An Irish farmer from Monaghan, Ireland, is awaiting trial on charges of indecent assault. 
indecent exposure, incest, buggery, sodomy and bestiality, allegedly involving his son, his daughter and unidentified travelling salesman and what has been described as a named dairy cow by a court in Dublin. The cow cannot be named to protect the identity of the farmer. Thunderbox. A 74-year-old man complained that ambulance men laughed their heads off when they discovered that his severe burns were the result of cleaning his toilet with lighter fuel, then throwing a cigarette into the toilet as he sat on it. <sighs> Ow. Stupid or what? Four friends from Virginia, USA, being somewhat the worse for wear after a drunken binge, decided to play chicken by lying between the tracks in front of an approaching freight train. Confident that said train would pass harmlessly over them, unfortunately, the train was fitted with a snowplow. <sighs> Ow! Bubblehead. Abnacrilla of Albany, Australia, was not what you might call a natural multitasker and came to grief while attempting to drive and chew gum at the same time. Things were going fine until he blew a huge bubble which burst in his face, blinding him and causing him to miss a bend and drive over a cliff. The People, 4th of the 9th, 94. Well done. Picture a farm in Naslat Imare, 240 miles south of Cairo. This was the setting for a series of disasters that beggar the imagination. A chicken had fallen down a 60-foot well. An 18-year-old farmer descended into the well to rescue said chicken, but succumbed to an undercurrent in the water, which pulled him down and drowned him. His brother followed him down the well in a rescue attempt, and also drowned. His other brother tried to rescue them both. He drowned as well, as did this sister. Two elderly farmers also pitched in, and, surprise, surprise, yes, they drowned as well. The bodies of all six were finally pulled out of the well, as was the chicken which was still alive. Axe victim. Ron Newman of Chatham has been sentenced to 140 hours of community service for beating his friend over the head with a guitar. The attack was prompted by his friend persistently playing the wrong chord in the Eagles song, Peaceful, Easy Feeling. Stop press. Theogenes, a native of Tassos and gladiator in the stable of cruel Prince Thesis, has been awarded the hardest bastard in the world title, although he retired around 900 BC. During his career, Theogenes killed 1,425 men with his bare hands. His speciality was beating his opponents to a pulp with his fists, which were wrapped in leather and studded with metal spikes. This snippet of information appears in this section, not because of Theogenes himself, but in tribute to the monumental error in judgment displayed by 1,424 people that queued up to fight him after he'd ripped the first one apart. Nutter. The World War I flying ace Jean Navarre once attacked a German Zeppelin with a bread knife. His number was up. According to the Independence of the 11th of the 1st, 1996, a Malium managed to escape from a San Francisco jail. His first deed on the outside was to dial 411 for directory inquiries. Unfortunately, he dialed 911 in error and was recaptured when the police turned up and noticed the shirt he was wearing had property of San Matteo County Jail written across the front, which was a bit of a giveaway, even to an American cop. A rude awakening. One Ken Charles Barger, 47, from Newton, N.C., was rudely awakened by the ringing of the telephone next to his bed. He reached out to answer it, but unfortunately grabbed the Smith & Wesson he kept next to the bed and fired it into his ear. The Hickory Daily Record, 21st of 12th, 92. Makes no mention of the caller. Stuck in New Zealand. If you live in Timaru, New Zealand, and your name's Grant Shittit, it's surely only a matter of time before something interesting happens to you. True to form, Mr. Shittit was making his way home after a bit of a night out, when he felt a sudden urge to lie down and have a nap on a convenient bed of moss he had come across. Unfortunately, when he awoke, he discovered said bed of moss was in fact fresh cement that had dried overnight, and he was well and truly stuck.
with only his head protruding. He screamed for help for 72 hours until a passing motorist stopped to help what he thought was an injured hedgehog. The local fire service finally freed him with road drills. Grant remarked that it was particularly uncomfortable because I'd been sick on myself in the night. Big issue. 20 for the third, 95. Barking mad. Prison officers in Florida came up with a spectacularly brilliant way to test their new tracker dog. They asked a double murderer, called David Graham, if he would be willing to pretend to escape while they tracked him with the dog. They even gave him a 30-minute start. Mr. Graham performed admirably. Unfortunately, the dog didn't, and the prisoner was long gone. Sunday Express, 30, 10, 94. A teeny error. Sarnich, British Columbia. A 17-year-old girl in a supermarket tried to pass a cheque for $184. Although she offered two pieces of ID, the cashier called the manager to verify the transaction. Is this you? the manager asked. Of course it is, replied the girl. Well, said the manager, then you're my ex-wife, but you don't look anything like her. Victoria, B.C., Times Colonist, 21 8, 92. Soapy voters. In 1970, voters in Picoatza, Ecuador, became so confused by an elaborate advertising campaign that they elected the brand of foot deodorant as their mayor. Flying Frank. Frank Reichelt invented the first parachute and, in 1912, declared that he would test it personally by jumping off the Eiffel Tower. He boasted, I am confident of success, which was admirable, but somewhat misguided. The parachute didn't work. Part 8. Transport. Early forms of locomotion relied heavily on the foot. The brighter individuals would use them in pairs. Walking wasn't the simple thing then that it is today, and walking schools sprung up across the globe as our ancestors descended from the trees and fell over. The ancient Arctic tundra was rife with hairy, stooped figures with L-plates stumbling around, trying to master the intricacies of the three-point turnaround, and the insanely difficult walking backwards round a corner manoeuvre. Early cavemen, on the pull, would saunter past groups of females and display their walking skills. However, there were always one or two who'd get a bit carried away, and a painful head-on collision was often the result. Mankind felt this need to travel as soon as he realised food didn't just turn up and ask to be considered as the main course for lunch. Instead, it seemed to have an annoying tendency to run away and get on with its own thing, which mostly consisted of not being clubbed, bitten, stabbed or eaten. Early hunting techniques involved skulking around in the underbrush, then suddenly leaping on a slow-moving shrub and eating its roots before it could get away. Some hunters had such a poor technique that many shrubs did in fact escape. These horticultural escapees met up and banded together in a safe enclave that, many years later, came to be known as Kew Gardens. Eventually, early humans had to reconcile themselves to the fact that if they wanted anything half decent to eat, they were going to have to damn well run after it. Some bright individuals noticed that they didn't seem to be catching much. This was because the animals they were chasing were faster than them. Many a protuberant forehead was scratched in consternation while this problem was considered. Around this time, the bravest human ever to walk the earth strode forward and actually tried to sit on a horse. Think about it. These days we take horse riding for granted. Anyone can go to a riding school and sit on a docile, knackered old cob while it autopilots its way around a few picturesque country lanes. But in prehistory, horses were wild. I take my hat off to the first guy that ever had the nerve to sit on top of a bucking, wild-eyed nut of a beast and say to himself, Now all I've got to do is tame it and learn to live with this hoof print on my face. Nothing much changed on the transport front for a few ice ages until the invention of the wheel. See inventions, the wheel. Which led, inevitably, to the development of the McLaren F1. OK, maybe I've skipped a bit here, but what's a few millennia between friends? Fair enough, I hear you say. But what about boats? Well, boats. Given that two-thirds of the Earth is covered by water, it's hardly surprising that one of mankind's early ambitions was to conquer the great oceans. The theory of floating was closely followed by the theory of sinking, 
and rapidly thereafter by the theory of waving, shouting and drowning. But the human race is nothing if not persistent. Persistent and stupid. Tribal elders would watch as their bravest warriors disappeared beneath the waves and wander off, muttering about how maybe they should have tried the vessel out on the pond first. They would also have decided to have a couple of words with the boat builder along the lines, maybe rock isn't the most efficient building material for boats, and you're dead. Throughout history, designers and builders of boats, planes and starships have always found a lame excuse to miss out on the maiden voyage of their creation. For some reason, the test pilots never seem to question this. If I was a test pilot, I'd ask the inventor if he was confident about the safety of the vehicle. If he answers in the affirmative, I'd say, well, it's you and me on the maiden run, then. This concept applies especially to that strangest of all boats, the submarine. Imagine the inventor giving his first presentation of the concept to the military. It's easy to visualise the generals grinning at each other going, yeah, right, who put you up to this? Let's face it, a boat that's designed to sink wouldn't immediately strike you as a great idea of the week. It sounds about as useful as a plane that's designed to crash, or a rifle that's precision engineered to blow your arms off. Nevertheless, submarines worked, and must have surprised quite a few naval types who probably assumed they were being attacked by exploding fish. Two hundred years after the takeover, or more correctly, the repossession of Hong Kong by the Chinese, much of the world's seaways became unnavigable, as the myriad boats congesting Hong Kong harbour expanded until it covered the South China Sea, and eventually the whole of the Pacific, with a log jam of junks. The only plus side of this was that you could use the boats to walk halfway round the world. Aircraft. Man's eternal dream has always been to fly like the birds. Sadly, given that the average human has the aerodynamic properties of a wardrobe full of conkers, this particular ambition had to sit in the corner and twiddle its fingers until technology caught up. The discovery that hot air rises was an early breakthrough. Sadly, a number of rare eagles plummeted to their deaths in hopeless fits of laughter when they realised how long it had taken us to work out something they'd been patiently demonstrating for eons. The hot air balloon of the Montgolfier brothers brought Paris to a standstill with its effortless ability to go up in the air and then come down again without anybody dying. Where can we go in this balloon? cried the aristocrats. Which way is the wind blowing? cried the Montgolfier brothers. West! cried the aristocrats. Well, we can go there, muttered the Montgolfier brothers, somewhat peeved that a bunch of idiot aristos with bad makeup had been so quick to uncover the Achilles heel of their great invention. Nevertheless, flying was such a novelty that the idea caught on. Any new form of transport is always seized upon by the military, who are always eager to exploit an advantage. The remainder of this section will deal almost exclusively with modes of transport developed or seconded by the military. This is simply and sadly because most major innovations in this sphere are funded and abused by a bunch of warmongering gits whose only interest in transport involves getting to a country as quickly as possible in order to kill the people who live there. Back to history. Tethered balloons were used in the First World War to send quaking privates aloft in order to ascertain enemy movements. We call this aerial intelligence gathering. The enemy called it target practice only in German, which probably takes longer. Aviation took off in a big way round this time. Gentlemen aviators took to the skies in biplanes and triplanes and tried to shoot each other politely while they swooped majestically above the mud and blood-filled trenches of the common soldiers who were too busy fighting the real war to notice. After World War II, pilots tended to be employed on meritocratic rather than aristocratic bases. This was simply because aircraft had become so fast. Just prior to World War III, the air forces of the world realised that they needed to find youngsters with incredible reflexes and stunning hand-eye coordination to fly their new jet fighters. A scheme was launched in conjunction with video game companies which would allow the military to record the scores of kids playing virtual reality flight simulator games at home, in arcades or on the internet. The highest scoring individuals would be inducted into the military to serve as fighter pilots for their country. The scheme looked perfect on paper. However, 
The military had failed to take into account the fact that kids who spend all their time playing video games at home or in arcades do so because they have no time for the authoritarian regime that schools impose. The last thing they wanted was to join the rigid disciplinary structure of the military. Unless, of course, the Air Force would agree to give them their own jet fighter and a private landing strip. Then, maybe if there was some kind of hassle with a foreign power, they might be willing to kick a little butt. But only if the deal was right. They had the military over a battle because they both knew there were only a handful of teenage individuals who were capable of piloting their latest fighters. The kids knew what they were worth. Money and mountain bikes changed hands. Of course, the first dogfight was a complete farce. The young pilots on both sides had been chatting on the internet for years. They hacked into the system, disabled all the real weapons and indulged in dogfights for points rather than lives. At first, the military were up in arms. However, as soon as they realised they weren't losing any expensive aircraft in these battles, they warmed to the idea, and by way of congratulating themselves for having thought of it, gave themselves a pay rise from the excess funds. Eventually, a new Geneva Convention decreed that in future, all air battles would be fought by teenagers in virtual reality over the internet. However, this was not the end of military lunacy. The mole tank of the late 21st century was one mode of military transport that signally failed to fulfil its potential. The Joint Chiefs of Staff responsible for the project knew they could attack from the air, from the sea, above or below, and from the land. However, they couldn't attack from under the land. Wouldn't it be useful, they postulated, if they could send troops underground? Troops that could then surface behind enemy lines and shoot them in the bum! when they weren't looking. The basic prerequisite, said the generals, and here they quoted Caesar, Napoleon and Capone, of any successful military operation is the ability to shoot the enemy in the backside when they're not looking. Western governments love this sort of jingoistic, tub-thumping dogma. They all said, hurrah, and headed for the subsidized bar. Thus was the mole tank invented. The vehicle was the size of a Greyhound bus and carried 50 highly trained, heavily armed troops who really didn't want to be there. The vehicle was designed to bore its way into the ground from a truck-mounted ramp and travel underground to its destination behind enemy lines, where it would surface, confounding Johnny Bad Guy so much that it would be easy to shoot. The Sinclair C5 of the 1980s was designed to revolutionise road transport. It was vastly more successful than the mole tank, which, due to lack of field trials, failed to accede adequately to the simple demands of navigation and geology. Sat-nav systems don't work too well underground, and even diamond-tipped bore drills have trouble with subterranean granite escarpments. Friction was another important factor that should have merited a tad more consideration. A number of mole tank crews were boiled alive when their air conditioning units failed to compete with the hull temperature. This particular problem was especially common to the Albanian built models, which included their revolutionary solar powered refrigeration option. Any soldiers that expressed their misgivings about the efficiency of a solar powered device in an underground environment were court martialed and shot. After all, a soldier's there to obey orders not get all clever, clever about technical boffin stuff. Of the 500 mole tanks deployed in action, 463 were finally listed as being on indefinite manoeuvres. This probably means they're still burrowing around somewhere, the half-life of their nuclear fuel being far in excess of the entire life of the crew. Of the remainder, seven mole tanks were found floating in the middle of the Pacific, Fourteen appeared in a variety of mine shafts around the world. Four were shot out of a geezer in Iceland. Two appeared in Vatican Square and had a shrine built around them. One blocked the Channel Tunnel, causing no problems whatsoever to anyone. One burst through the floor of a rave in Ibiza and got a round of applause. Two surfaced simultaneously and collided at Venice Beach in LA, where they were sold as neo-humanist sculpture to Sony for $8 billion by a wino. Four surfaced at Mount Rushmore in the form of four diamond-tipped revolving noses. The remaining two actually appeared behind enemy lines, deployed their troops and achieved a great victory over two one-legged peasants and a guy with a particularly vicious-looking catapult. The project was declared a major success 
and a further $20 trillion was invested in the enterprise by Congress. Part 10. Inventions. When analysing a new invention, in order to determine its usefulness and possible impact on our lives, there is a simple question you can ask yourself, which will tell you all you need to know. The question is, what is the problem to which this invention is the solution? For example, the solution to the problem of how to drive more safely on a road at night is cat's eyes. The solution to the problem of how to leave obvious, hard-to-lose messages in an office is post-it notes. What on earth is the question to which a pot noodle is the answer? Any innovation can and should be judged using this approach. Interestingly, you can also turn the question around. Thus, solution, the lottery. Problem, how can the government collect additional taxes to fund needy causes in the arts? Solution, the internet. Problem, how can we get boring computer nerds to stay at home looking at the world through a little screen while we go out and enjoy it first hand? Having said this, I'm on the internet myself, but I still go out, okay? Our greatest invention, the wheel. The wheel was invented by a prehistoric man who noticed a log rolling down a hill. A stunning new way to revolutionise transport began to form in his hazy Cro-Magnon mind. Unfortunately, the idea and the log hit him at about the same time. So man still had to drag things round for another few thousand years, until some other bright spark, more fleet of foot, and possessing an inherent talent for log avoidance, came up with the wheel concept. Many things in man's history have been invented by watching things roll down hills. Someone watching a cart roll down a steep incline into a river came up with the idea of vehicle insurance. A guy watching his mother-in-law roll down a mountain into an alligator-infested gully spontaneously discovered laughter. A man sitting on a runaway wagon wore both shoes out during his rapid and somewhat panic-stricken invention of brakes. Skis were invented by a guy who was watching Bjorn, Longfoot's Venson, going into town down a snow-covered mountain slope. Of course, Bjorn could have invented skis himself. Unfortunately, the idea never occurred to him because he didn't need them. So you see, hills were crucial in providing inspiration to early inventors. Perhaps this is why Holland is only famous for tulips and clogs, neither of which are much use on hills. Many inventions are simply modern revisions of ancient ideas. A goat herd in Sumeria came up with the idea of post-it goats, many centuries before the office supply business took off. He would scrawl important messages on the side of goats to remind the villagers of important feast days. Sadly, these feast days normally involved the slaughter of a goat. The phrase, don't kill the messenger, was coined at this time, probably by a goat. One of my favourite inventions of all time is Potty Putty, because it bounces, it squashes flat, it flows like liquid, it even picks up newsprint, but it's completely useless. They even had a nationwide competition when I was at school to see if anybody could come up with a use for it. To this day, I haven't heard of a winner. The clockwork radio was an interesting invention, primarily targeted at countries that don't have the luxury of a national grid to supply power. However, this probably means they don't have a local radio station, so all they can hear is the world service talking a bunch of gibberish in a foreign language. Great idea, though. I'm just waiting for the clockwork car. Unfortunately, you probably have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger's big brother in order to wind it up. 2217 saw so the introduction of the Nograv flying helmet, a piece of high-tech headgear that allowed people to float about, hanging from their helmets. This wasn't quite as painful as it sounds. However, there were some teething problems with the sports model which had such fast acceleration that a number of people had their heads ripped off and shot into space. This model was discontinued and is now a much sought after collector's item, especially by people in unhappy marriages who are looking for that special birthday gift. Young Skin. Invented in 2165 and touted as the ultimate cosmetic, Young Skin could give anyone the skin of a child. Unfortunately, the child involved tended to suffer somewhat, and the process was outlawed 20 minutes after its launch. Real virtual reality. Hyped as the ultimate experience, real virtual reality was launched by an East End software company in 2109. 
vastly expensive, it claimed to allow computer users to leave their consoles and enter a real virtual world that was indistinguishable from the real world. It proved a bestseller for many months until people noticed a marked increase in computer types wandering around the city streets, poking things and feeling strangers' faces in a state of abject wonder. Dark. The speed of light has always been an important constant in physics. However, in 2137, Magnus Sunsonson claimed to have recorded the speed of dark and found it to be faster. He postulated that light was merely a very bright version of dark, which was in fact the ultimate constant in the universe. Sunsonson pointed out that the vast majority of the universe is in fact dark and the only light is provided by big things on fire that are dotted here and there within the universal dark. Many established physicists suddenly became afraid of the dark as it challenged the very basis of their beliefs and more importantly their research funding. They didn't relax until Sunsonson admitted the whole thing had merely been a highly technical advertising campaign to promote a rock band called the Dark. The band's only single, Dark the Hellish Angels Sing, managed to get to number 47 in the US charts, but stayed at number one in Albania for 14 years. Ironically, Magnus Sunsonson's bogus Dark theory was proved to be correct 15 years later. But by that time, he had joined a neo-New Age cult and moved to a bubble on Io, where he changed his name to Tree Apostle Sunshine Bunny Bunny Shrubfrondle and spent his days ranting about the evils of kitchen appliances and formica. The Big Suck The Big Suck was the world's first upwards waterfall, built as a part of the Great Exhibition of 2253. The Big Suck utilised gravitic induction to send millions of tonnes of water flooding up the side of Mount Everest. Sadly, no one had anticipated that the water would freeze when it reached the top. Everest grew at an alarming rate until it pierced the ozone layer, causing a heat wave in Antarctica that confused no end of penguins. Inventions and sex. Throughout history, major inventions and sex have always been inextricably intertwined. I guarantee that the first wheeled vehicle ever produced was borrowed by the inventor's son and used for a romantic liaison on the evening of its creation. The creative urge and the sexual imperative have always been driving forces during mankind's development. It's little wonder they often become intertwined. I shan't bore you with the erotic possibilities of the Euclidean screw or the sensual potential of the spinning jenny. Instead, I shall leap forth into a discourse on the relative merits of the most ubiquitous of grey box-like beeping things. The computer. Question. What is this universal infatuation with the internet? If someone had told me a few years ago that we'd be looking at a phone call that you've got a type as a major innovation, I'd have had them certified. And don't say, but you can send pictures as well. Because it takes about an hour to download a bloody picture, and half the time the tits are out of focus. Oops. <laughs> if I want to send someone a picture, I'll use a brand new innovation called a stamp. Maybe I'm just getting old. However, there's something else that's really worrying me. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's called dildonics. For anyone that isn't familiar with this term, it refers to the equipment they have in development at the moment, which enables us to have sex with our computers. I don't know about you, but the only way I'm ever going to screw my computer is by plugging it in wrongly. I must confess, I am seriously worried about the whole concept of dildonics. It actually involves you putting your dick in a mechanical device that's linked to a computer. Are you sure? What happens if there's a power surge or a systems crash? It could rip your dick off and fax it to the calendar before you know what's happening. No, thank you. I'll stick to the real thing. Come on, you know where you are with a good magazine. How many people are surprised that the most popular sites on the internet are pornographic? As I've already pointed out, every time someone comes up with a new invention, some guy will immediately work out a way to get sex involved. As soon as the camera was invented, I can personally guarantee that the first film ever developed included at least two pictures of the inventor's girlfriend's tits. I can remember when Polaroid cameras hit the shops. All right, guys, what's the first thing you thought? You don't have to send the film to the chemist. They can be as saucy as you want. It's pathetic, but it's what we're like. It's a guy thing. 
I guarantee that if a guy invents invisibility at midday, he'll be in the ladies' showers at the local leisure centre by one o'clock. This concept was demonstrated perfectly when Professor Blowfish, prior to his dismissal from Imperial College, finally perfected the Spanner Scanner, a device which allowed the events occurring in a previous time span at any location to be viewed again. Due to the limitations of the power supply, however, the device could only replay events that had transpired during the last two milliseconds. Professor Blowfish was forced to resign from the faculty when he was found by the bursar, giggling and foaming at the mouth, viewing the offence that had just occurred in a female biochemistry student's room. The bursar immediately placed the equipment under lock and key and refused to release it for any reason whatsoever, unless cash was involved. By a strange coincidence, I recently visited that very bursar a sum of money and a piece of equipment change hands. I am now watching you, listening to this recording. Spooky eh?